I, I met with a company that does their whole training is now converted over where they send people instead of training materials, they send them an Oculus headset and they conduct the training in there. Interestingly, if you think about this, you know, how much is it to go to a conference? When we go to a conference or a training, imagine what the cost of this is. Just regular travel. You're going to be at least $1,000 out anywhere you travel. And Oculus costs less than that. And you can simulate things that you couldn't simulate another way. The question always becomes, what does the social aspect go and how much do you need that and how do you facilitate that and so forth. So I, I don't have an answer for that. I, I tell you, my question around that is truly after COVID, how do we build trust in this new environment? How do you, the three of us here, create an environment to have a trusting conversation where I truly share with you what I feel without actually ever having met? Welcome, Robert. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. So they call you Mr. Internet of Things. How did you get that name? <laughs> it's a long story. When we uh, started our IoT practice, we decided to create a video, mm -hmm. an internal video, actually, to just energize the team. And uh, when I met with the producer and creator, he pointed me to a video where they had an introduction to windmills, and right. they called the guy Mr. Wind. Right. And so we played with this and said, okay, we're going to call the guy in the video, Mr. IoT. Yeah. And after that, that kind of stuck to me rather than the guy in the video. So that's how it started. So in a way, though, you know, you're called the Mr. IoT, but your interest is much more wider than the Internet of Things, is it not? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's IoT is like cloud and enabler, right? In its own, IoT doesn't do anything, right? If you don't adjust behavior, if you don't change outcomes, IoT is just another technology. So I imagine people are coming to you with problems all the time, right? You know, so where does your mind begin? Because you're not going to a person saying, well, here's your problem. Here's the future, right? They're coming to you and saying, well, we've got this issue. How can we approach this? How, could, how might we use technology to put us in a different place? You know, so how do you, how do you think about it? They don't even come with the problem. It's often that they come and they say, we want to digitize our business. And that's such a big term. And so that often encompasses IoT as a part of that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the sensors around us give us information to really improve our decisions. But uh, IoT is just a component of this. That's one aspect. Uh, the other aspect is often that we do have someone come to us and say, hey, look, I just talked to someone where they want to really know what their tank and uh, levels are in gas stations and their pump status. Mm -hmm. Because when the gas pump is broken, then they don't make any money. And so they want to sensorize it that way. And so, you know, we have a conversation. What's a good way to go about this? Interestingly enough, sometimes the sensor is as simple as a video camera. Mm -hmm. We've had this in factories <laughs> where they have these human uh, HMIs, human interface panels. And it is much harder to actually directly connect into this and create a network than put a camera next to it. And then through learning, actually read off the screen like a human what's on there and then make, make digital decisions based on that, which is a pretty interesting kind of way of going about it. People don't typically think of it this way. So, so, so you know, technology as an idea, are they coming to you? Because, because over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, most businesses have had to think about a change in the way that they work, right? And technology has played some role in that change, unless it's a really a dinosaur company, right? So is the idea, how do we make something more efficient, you know, at its core? Like, why do I need to further digitize my company? Different reasons. Example, in a factory, they wanted to produce more of whatever they were producing. And by increasing their throughput by 10%, reducing scrap, putting more through, they avoided spending a bunch of working capital to build another factory line next to it. So really, it was a saving in multiple ways. Now, did they come to you and say, well, we want to build another factory? And you said, well, wait a minute, don't build the other factory. Let's just make this factory more efficient. In this case, it was a factory line itself. They realized that they could potentially be more efficient. They didn't quite know where. So we came in and started analyzing it, sensorizing aspects of it, not sensorizing other aspects. And so together then we determined, yeah, you don't need another factory line. We can produce more. You know, that's not the smart, is that the smart factory in Wichita? 
No, that's something completely different. No, that's an actual client of ours. The smart factor in which it does truly a showcase for us to show people what can be done. It's a very modern way where we actually produce product that's customizable at the outset. And we then walk people through it from start to finish, all the way from product design all until the end where it actually leaves the factory on the back. In this case, we actually give it to our clients, right? We don't ship it anywhere, but it's also really a showcase for partners of ours. So we have in there a variety of different software and hardware partners that work with us on clients and they showcase their product and we showcase how we work together. So NASA has you know, thousands and thousands of sensors, you know, the American people paid for them and, and anybody can use them. So are you always thinking about, you know, what sensors are out there that might give us a new way of looking at problems? You know, Not are, sure. the, are, the, are the sensors important or is it the act of deploying the ideas together to make the factory more efficient? The sensors are just a, a way of gathering data. If you don't use the data in any meaningful way, then no. We always say that it's about outcomes. It's about what behavior do you influence with what data you get out of there. I strongly believe actually that we often have more data than we really uh, know what to do with. And it's about using the data in an effective way to then influencing how you or someone else uh, acts upon the data, right? Just having the data isn't good enough. That doesn't really help. So that's one answer. I, I also want to say there is often senses that help us think of problems in a new way or in a very old way. Uh, examples of this are, as I said, video. We now can analyze video in a much faster way where we can really make real-time decisions based on video. Mm -hmm. Audio is another one of those. How often have we heard this from someone that has worked at a particular place around a car or around a factory machine and says, that machine doesn't sound right, but that sound. So what can we do with this? Um, and, and these are actually quite complicated problems because we are pretty damn smart how we've learned over time to analyze this. So it's really only the last few years through huge compute that was added mostly through the cloud that we can actually go through the data in a, in a fast and meaningful way. One of the things we do today also is we complement the sensors out there with compute on the edge. So you have computing power on the edge, maybe right next to the sensor, within the sensor. The sensor itself might not be it. You've probably heard about AI with video sensors that actually do a lot of the analysis right there and then. How does that work with video? I'm not, I don't, I'm not quite, I don't quite follow that. Well, you have to build a library, right? Well, what I was talking about specifically with video was that now we have chips that are high powered specifically targeting video analysis. And so you can do artificial intelligence right there next to the video camera, the uh, compute that's built in. So you'll see uh, very smart. Um, it's interestingly enough, a lot of this you can see already somewhere out in the consumer market, what can be done around security cameras, what gets done at airports in security cameras right there. And then it doesn't have to be sent through a network okay. over to the cloud, massive data, and then analyzed. No, no, no. This can be done right there. So there surveillance is... then. I mean, we're really talking about surveillance. Is that right? Uh, it might not be surveillance. It might be other things such as what's the flow of product through? Do I have product defects in the product when it gets produced on the factory line? You know, when we talk about cameras, often people immediately go to surveillance, but uh, it often is actually something different. I have an example with an airline client of mine where they looked at luggage mm. because one of the things about luggage is if you think about the old days when we boarded planes all the time how often did it happen and someone on the way back needed to send the luggage all the way forward and if you can actually figure out before they get on the plane before the boarding at the end of the jetway how much luggage i still have what room i still have then i'm gonna be able to cut my turnaround time down significantly and as you know turnaround time is a huge cost factor for your lines. Can we get everybody boarding the plane in the right way, please, after all these years? Put the first class people in at the end? I mean, I've never understood that whole thing, but anyway, that's a different problem. So how do you see, when you see these sort of developments, Robert, you know, what do you see as the future of work? You know, do you see it keep evolving and being less human driven over time? I don't think so. I know that's one of the concerns people have that the computer is going to take over for me. But at the end of the day, I mean, um, we're hoping, you know what I mean? Well, no, but it's, it's the upscaling. I'm glad right? we have the computer take over for me. Our, 
There's that, that whole thing about upskilling, right? We need to continue to retrain human capital to be doing other things. Like these jobs do one thing, right? We're always going to need the human interaction. But sorry, what was your I mean, What's your thought, thought, Robert? We still need the human to act on things. We still need to have the human go and say, yep, that's a good decision. Or I will make the decision. Many people today help prepare the decision. But it's a little bit like, if you remember, one of the very early artificial intelligence use cases people talked about was analysis of x-rays. And at the end of the day, the doctor still had to look at what the computer suggested. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that the doctor didn't have to look at this anymore and you were sent off to have something cut out of you um, <laughs> by a robot. Right. It was actually the other way around. It was the doctor got a lot more information from other areas. And this is very much the same here. I don't get a subset of this much which is like all i get like my information what i have maybe this much but now i have input from all these other areas and i can much quicker take input from other areas through that which is how i look at what the senses give me and how it enables better decision making for me you know how, how do you think that things like the metaverse or blockchain are going to affect some of these decisions about a factory or an airport or a a place does it is is there a new form of technology on the horizon that may make our lives better in some other way you know some intermediate step tell me what you mean by when you say metaverse well when you when we're talking about the metaverse to say that i have a uh I go online and I start talking to other people online in a, in a you know as my avatar and I'm able to get uh music there that I you know, in a quick way and have an interaction with other people there that, you know, makes me feel that I'm gone to a music festival, even though I'm just sitting in my home and I'm using a headset, you know, that vision, does that vision affect our societies in some new way? Is it, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Let me start by saying I have been in a special meeting with other people where I did this, I stood up, I walked around with a whole lens and and suddenly people were around me actually in this room and the room looked different and it was interesting. Me personally, I didn't get that experience that I felt like, oh, I want to have all my meetings this way. I actually felt this was still a little more interactive for me. So what I have done a lot and what I really truly believe and expect out of the metaverse is it's going to get us closer to actually embracing, we often call it amb ambient computing. And what I mean by that is, is that we combine data sensors around us with three-dimensional ways of looking at that. Augmented reality, if you wish, or virtual reality. I don't really think virtual so much as augmented. And we've done that. If you go online and you look for the virtual factory by Deloitte, you'll find an app that we created actually for a conference. And what we did was, this all started out by us saying, look, we want to showcase a factory to people at a keynote. You can't bring a factory line on a stage. Mm -hmm. You barely can bring a factory line on a show floor. Mm -hmm. So we decided, let's turn this around. Let's create an augmented reality app. And what we did is we created an app you can have on your phone, the virtual factory with Deloitte. Uh, we also have a version for the iPad. And what happens is we had a 30 by 30 space with the bathtub in the middle because the virtual factory makes rubber ducks and you've got to always test your rubber duck in a, in a bathtub, right? right. But there was nothing else there. There was a floor with a really cool pattern. And people would walk up to us and say, what are you doing here? Where, where, where's Deloitte? And yeah. we'd take the iPad and we'd point the iPad at the floor mm. and boom, there would be a full-size, life-size factory line popping up in front of them. Right. And it would move. It would actually have little Easter eggs in there. It would teach you something. And here's the thing that fascinated me. Two things happened. Number one, people would take the iPad away from us. They'd like take it and want to walk themselves. So the engagement that we created through that was fantastic. And I think this is what the metaverse or augmented reality will do for us. It'll increase engagement if it's done right. That's number one. Number two, and this was sort of the proof in the pudding for me, people would walk around these machines like they actually existed. You'd give them this iPad, they look through it, and there's a machine in front of them. It's not there. The floor is empty. Mm -hmm. Yet they walk around like through the floor and like we could guide them. And really, obviously, we hit the Easter eggs inside the machines, right? We wanted them to kind of like play with that. But the fact that they didn't do that was sort of the truth factor for me. So like the proof that it actually gives them an experience and how real it becomes. And so for me, I want to bring this back to the metaverse. I just think that it's going to 
push us even further forward to deal with our surroundings in a much more mixed reality way. Yeah. And is that an avatar in a meeting tomorrow? Maybe someday. But can I, I just throw something out? Jesse and I were at a conference in New York a couple of years ago when people used to go into the world. <laughs> I guess we're back now. And, you know, this idea was used to kind of create some kind of empathy, compassion on people having the experience of being in war or at that, at that point it was Syrian refugee camps. You remember that, Jesse? We're at that, that conference. This idea of trying to create a real understanding of what it, A, to give somebody the experience of the other. So one idea could be we would go through and what does it really mean to be even in Ukraine right now, really be in Ukraine, or at that point it was Syrian refugee camp. But also it was there's something to do with training also uh, soldiers about Or that. people who work in nuclear power plants. Yeah, or, or yeah, trying to go and get rid of, you know, where there's the old bomb, you know, landmines and things like that. Is there other applications you think around this idea of metaverse or this different reality that can really be hugely problem solving on on bigger i mean you'll work on you work on very big problems but on other kinds of problems well. like uh is there a potential for it for you know to to help people you know in some kind of way yeah it's happening today right I doctors do it with surgeries right mm -hmm. the idea that you can do a remote surgery with someone absolutely is happening today in certain areas right it's happening in areas of as you said training scenarios how do you actually get people to not just train certain emergency situations? You can't, like you're in a power plant, a nuclear power plant, you're not going to turn certain things off and simulate this for real. You got to do this in some simulated form of fashion. But what happens is you talked about empathy, but you also get the adrenaline push behind that. And so therefore you learn how to deal with those kind of things. Firefighters, instead of having the actual situation to train, can you train certain ways this way? I, I met with a company that does, their whole training is now converted over where they send people instead of training materials, they send them an Oculus headset and they conduct the training in there. Interestingly, if you think about this, you know, how much is it to go to a conference? When we go to a conference or a training, imagine what the cost of this is. Just regular travel. You're going to be at least $1,000 out anywhere you travel. An Oculus costs less than that. And you can simulate things that you couldn't simulate another way. The question always becomes, what does the social aspect go and how much do you need that? And how do you facilitate that and so forth? So I, I don't have an answer for that. I, I tell you my question around that is truly after COVID, how do we build trust in this new environment? How do you, the three of us here, create an environment to have a trusting conversation where I truly share with you what I feel without actually ever having met? And that's the part I don't really have an answer for. How do people spend millions of dollars with each other based on this interaction, right? How do you create something that actually creates trust in that Great world? question. I mean, you know, a lot of people are doing therapy online. When you think about that kind of a relation, that's a personal relation, obviously. But what is how, because we take, accept it as reality. I mean, I, I feel like we're having a real conversation. I hope you feel the same way, but I feel I like- do, I do, I do, but I just thought it's a really interesting question, right? How do the three of us build trust to each other, right? Yeah. And what do I trust to tell you and what don't I? It's, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, we have, you know, a couple hundred people who work at Wonders during the pandemic, you know, we went completely virtual, like so many companies. And there are a lot of people here at this company that I've never met them in person. I feel like over time, this technology has made me sort of for, forget that like, you know, not being able to look somebody in the eye, you know, whether that is, is the most meaningful thing being in a room with them. You know, the other thing is that you know, in, in one sense, you have uh, virtual reality go, or, or say augmented reality going down one lane, you know, but let's say that, let's say that I was an architect now and I wanted to show you my building and I don't want to show it to you in, in over Zoom. Do we have the computing power that we can each have our iPads next to us and we can go, okay, let's look at the building. We're all looking at the building at the same time. You know, do you think that that'll become more common over time? Do we have enough you know, computing to be able to do that now? We do. We do. And really, I mean, that's what that's why I said, right? All it would take is if you wanted to do a spatial experiment, because architecture is an interesting example, right? You can't really see space the way in this two-dimensional media we do right now. Right. However, you can see space in a three-dimensional media, right? And when you think of building a house, 
I want to know how big is my bedroom going to feel like to me rather than like, I mean, I don't know what you do, but I take tape and I mark uh, outlines on tape. So I feel my furniture goes and so forth. You could do that very easily in a holographic environment, whatever technology you want to use. It's as cheap as a few hundred, I don't know what an Oculus is nowadays, but something like this, right? So yes, you can. Right. Um, I actually have a question for you. Can I ask you a question? Sure, of course. Of course. Uh, I'm curious to, on the trust question before, you made an interesting comment, which is so true for me too. Lots of people we hired, I haven't met in person. Actually, this is true for much of in Deloitte. Often yeah. we, we work with people long before we actually meet them. And then we meet in front of the client with them for the first time, which is funny. And we've worked for hours and hours and hours right. with each other. <laughs> but I'm curious for you, my question is to turn around. How do you trust people that you hire to actually be good patrons of your money do you trust them if you haven't met them what do you do to build trust i think that's a it's a great question how do we we do trust them we put a lot well, of you have what, do you, what do you personally do i'm just really curious oh, okay how person does it how do, you, what, so, how do you build trust to me it's a one-on-one -on -one, or it's like a conversation you and i would meet you would say priscilla we want to poach you and bring you over to deloitte as the chief creative officer and so you, you and I would have a, I'm just doing a fake scenario here, Jesse. And so yeah. we would- So um, you're not going anywhere. I, okay, so you and I would have a, a kind of a conversation. I have taken Zoom into my heart now and I, I just feel like we're now in the room together because we've done so much time. You and I, I would have a long conversation with you and we talk about things we like, culture, what have you been working on? And I, it starts there and it, it's still the same thing as if you were in the room with me. It's a feeling for me, this is me. We all have a different thing. It's an instinct. It's it is hard. I don't know how you. I mean, it, it's a great question. Scaling and hiring to me, though, it is still about a conversation with somebody and and then trying to see how that conversation goes and are we sharing semantics? Do we understand the words the same way? Right. Yeah, what are the values? Know, it's about values. Yeah. Trying to find values. I think really trusting somebody, you know, you have to work with them every day and it, it takes time to develop those relationships. They're not particularly quick to get there with the person. You know, there has to be accountability in a relationship. I think it's it's all those old fashioned human things, yeah. even though we're using technology to empower these uh, relationships in a somewhat different way. I mean, what I love about uh, Zoom, even though I get weary of it being on it all day, is that, you know, our team is across the country. We have four offices and you know, people all over the country now because it doesn't matter where you work from. And we work with teams all over the world. So I can just go from one meeting to the next meeting and be in those places with those people. And uh, I think that really helps. You know, it helps to make the world a little bit smaller. Uh, yeah. and, and as we, you know, we deal with the pandemic, which was sort of, in my mind, a, a failed test of all of our, societies across the world. It should have been an opportunity for us all to connect together and make the world a, a bit smaller. It ended up, you know, that we were not able to cooperate with a lot of the other countries around COVID. And now I think that Zoom is here to stay. I think the old fashioned idea of going into an office every day is sort of gone. Now a factory is a different story, but, but for what we're doing, where it's trying to understand uh, human behavior and why people are making decisions, a lot of it can be done here. I mean, it's, it's sort of an interesting question. I mean, what do you think about sort of, well, you, this is your area of expertise as the chief technology officer, but do you think you can create trust and create culture? You know, what, how do you create culture, that company culture, and then, and then relationship with clients? Yeah, that um, company culture is a real diabolical thing on the, on Zoom, you know? Or is, I mean, I don't know, how do you think about it? I don't have an answer for you in company culture. I struggle with that a lot from a philosophical point of view because we've so much relied on company culture being based on the cafeteria and yeah. bean bags. You know, there's so much related to an office, if you wish. Yeah. And if it was all related to going out after work, then that's a whole different problem in its own, right? So right. I, I don't really have a good answer for you on culture. I, I question how large companies are going to do with keeping culture the way they thought of it. I think, this is my personal opinion, this isn't based on research, but I believe this is why many CEOs struggle so much with this virtual concept, because a lot of the carrots, if you wish, are gone. Yeah. 
with the ability to be virtual. And if you think about it, social interactions, we need them, but now where do we find them? We find them in our life outside of sitting on Zoom or Zooming with friends, right? I mean, I've had birthday parties where people do online games with each other on Zoom and they were fun, we enjoyed that. So I don't really have a good answer on uh, company culture. On trust, I, <laughs> I have this thing, someone said this to me once, I was in some presentation and the person said, trust isn't something you earn, this is something you give. Mm-hmm. And I sat there and I was like, it's like one of those moments when you kind of like, your mind blows up and you don't feel good in your body because suddenly someone said something that mm-hmm. makes you right. realize- Changed your world, yeah. Well, it was sort of like, oh, there's something going on with me that sort of like, really, I've made people earn my trust for a long, long time. And how would that feel if I give my trust at first? And that's a really tricky situation. It's a really interesting concept to think about. So I don't know how that lands for you, but I sit with this to this day. You know, do I give trust? Do I have people earn my trust? And in a certain way, they still do have to earn. Like in me, I really want people to earn my trust. And then I kind of get into this and then, yeah, if I don't tell them something that really matters to me, how can they trust me? And how can we have an authentic conversation? So I try to lead with giving you something like this story is meaningful to me, right? It was something that really kind of like, oof, it was scary because I want people, it's like, well, what happens if I should tell you this story? How are you going to use this against me? At the end of the day, I've gotten to an age now where if we find out this doesn't work, I'm just going to cut my losses, right? But that's how I think about trust now. And this is the dilemma that goes on in my head. And that's what I wonder. So I loved your answer, but it's a one-on-one relationship, right? It's sort of like, you know, you got to sit there, you got to talk with each other and see, you know, what values do we have? And by the way, how do we differ? Right, because there's this whole thing about how do I create diversity in my team? Because if everybody just tell me the same thing, then you know we're never gonna go anywhere. So that's how I feel about it. I don't have a good answer on culture. That was a great answer, though. I just want to say, because that is to make yourself vulnerable is really what you're saying. You know, you you give trust. You just say this is how I'm feeling, or whatever that moment is 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 incredibly. I don't think people do that, and at least I think. I don't think people do that enough. And and I think when the team was talking to you earlier, it it goes to also how are generationally people feeling? Do younger generations, you know, some of the millennials and, and you know, younger kids just saying they just reveal everything they've grown up talking about themselves. Now, some of it is maybe problematic because it's designed for a certain profile. But do you think generationally we're seeing that people have a different way to also think about trust and sharing and oversharing and giving things, you know, I never, for example, I just, I always say yes, you know, I go to a new website, yes, sure, you can read, you know, it's probably the worst thing in the world, whoever's watching this, you could break into my thing in five seconds, but it, do we, do you see generations coming to it differently, the idea of trust? Absolutely. Um, I see it with my sons, right? My sons come to me with questions that I never asked my dad now that they're in the early 20s. And I'm like, whoa. Thanks for asking. It's like, wow. So I see their EQ being much higher. I like that. I'd like to take some credit as the father, but maybe that's not fair. Uh, Who knows? Uh, But I do think that's true. I also think there's a big difference generationally. uh, And I think we sometimes struggle with this impact and contributions to outside are way more important than shareholder profits and shareholder value. It's, it's interesting when you listen to someone like Mark Benioff, the CEO of, of Salesforce, because he's starting to switch this really around. But, you know, I was just on a conversation with someone else and they said, yeah, revenue hasn't been our number one goal anymore. It's other things. And I do think that is really where we can build the new culture around. It's yeah. much more the impact they make. And I just wish that we're going to stop talking about people's weaknesses and how to fix them and much more talk about how people's strengths can be leveraged towards what they do. In a sense, that's a return to an older time, you know, to to a time where it, it fundamentally asks the question, what is the purpose of a company? You know, is it only shareholder value or is it actually built for the people who work there long term to invest their time and energy and to be rewarded for that part of the process. I think there's probably a balance, but it really should do both, you know? I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? We all got to still eat, right? So there's got to be some money involved, but um, I don't know about you. Money doesn't motivate me. Money just gets me to do things that I enjoy doing, but it's not the thing, you know, these conversations excite me. 
it doesn't mean that i mean you didn't pay me anything so therefore money doesn't really make any yeah. money on this one <laughs> but, you know i i came here because i wanted to chat i didn't come here because you paid me something yeah. right that tells you something about how i feel about this and you know it's much more about did i make an impact to someone and that's much more interesting to me i wanted to come back to something else actually that was talked about before because i think it was super interesting. You talked about different metaphors and how augmented reality gives us an ability to paint pictures differently, show difficult concepts to people in new ways because people learn differently. I think that's enormously powerful. I do think what that means, though, this is, I think, the part that's difficult. You need a different skill set to get there. Creating experiences is different than creating a process. And we've taught for so many years, process, 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 process. An experience is not a process. And if you give someone just a process in augmented reality, you're gonna put me to sleep and I'm not even gonna get to the end of that. And so I do think that uh, experiences, concepts and so forth are very critical. And uh, it's an interesting dynamic I see out there a lot where we talk about gamification. I worked for Activision for a while, so I was very close to that. I think, and I hope we see more of this, and I hope that this whole metaverse thing will bring back some of that more experiential, more fun, more sort of learning and interacting with each other than just process. And yeah. I guess you the value. More fun, I think. Yeah. More fun. Yeah. Hasn't been so much fun for a lot of people. Gotta laugh and smile, you know? Yeah, I agree. And cry a little. Yeah, a lot and a lot of crying. This has been wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Come on and and I love it just, you know, you really gave me something to think about. You give your trust. It's a beautiful thing to think about. So well, it's the pleasure pleasure meeting you. you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And, um, till we till we meet again. Yeah. <laughs> till we meet again. In the metaverse yeah. as avatars. In the metaverse. <laughs> Ciao. Hi Robert. Ciao.